This is Pretty Much Pop, a culture podcast for and by people with the attention span of an unusually patient gnat. Today we're again talking about video games, this time focusing on casual games. I'm Mark Lintonmeyer, currently in a casual relationship with several games, but I did stay up until 2.45 a.m. last night playing Stardew Valley on my iPad. Do you have some, America? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm just crushing it. <laughs> and I'm Brian Hurt. And well, we hope you enjoy this free version of our podcast. For just 99 cents more, you can have it delivered 25% faster. <laughs> or just press that little speed up button on your player. Nick, introduce yourself. Where are you coming from here? Hi, I'm Nick Fortuno, and I'm coming from New York City right now. Like about a stone's throw from Columbia University. Thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you for having me. And we should say, my daughter was geeked. Was geeked? Is that the correct? Why does that sound unnatural? <laughs> to hear that the creator of Diner Dash, which was probably one of the first games that I showed her and that she got a little bit addicted to when she was, you know, nine or whatever. That's the thing that has been most successful, right, for you? If you know a game I made, that's the one you know. <laughs> okay. Can you give us a little overview of the other stuff you do, what your career is about, why we picked you for this? I've been a game designer uh, for about 24 years. I started in an innovative game studio called Game Lab, and we were one of the earliest independent game developers. And we really specialized in games for non-game players, like casual games, games for healthcare, games for education, games for politics, stuff like that. And so my background really is in making games outside of the hardcore game market, really for, for all sorts of other kinds of game players, whether they be people who don't think of themselves as gamers or in contexts where games aren't normally played. And I've probably worked on like, I don't know, like 40 different digital titles in my career, as well as a bunch of board games and real world games and various kind of mixes of games and technology. Real world? What is this real world? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the before times, we used to actually play games in public. Uh, and, and I even had a festival with a few other people called uh, Come Out and Play, where you would actually like make new games in public. And we did that for like 16 years before the world ended. So that was cool. <laughs> Damn. We're in the middle times before the world begins again. Hopefully. We'll see. So, Nick, I always have to ask, what kind of games do you like to play? One of the things that happens when you're a game designer is you start end up doing you know, research all the time. Like you, you end up as a researcher, right? And you start having this weird appreciation. So I like all sorts of weird directions. I like rhythm action games a lot. And I like really, really hammered on everything Harmonix made for a long time. I was a giant Civ fan. And I played Civ for hundreds of hours when I was a kid. I was, I was running a live action role playing game and I would play Civ the day after the game while everyone was calling me. This is in the 90s. Everyone was calling me to like report on what they did. And then on the casual side, I experiment with things all the time. I get kind of addicted to card games. I get addicted to puzzle games. Like I'm more into games of skill than games of grind. And then I play a lot of board games and a lot of role playing games, like as kind of a hobbyist. I actually was thinking that Civ was a casual game just in in terms of the type of game that it is, but clearly, no, it is a strategy game and people sink many, many hours into it. I guess I just am such a non-casual person that even when it's a a phone game or it's, you know, a flash game, I feel like lots of people do not play these so-called casual games very casually. Well, that was one of the big myths. This was like kind of debunked about, I don't know, 10 years ago at a white paper that was produced by the Casual Games Conference that used to be run in Seattle and it's kind of moved around since then. And one of the things the white paper demonstrated is that while casual gamers thought they played games for less hours, they actually played an equivalent number of hours as hardcore game players. The difference was in the expectation of how long you play. Like if you sit down and you say, I'm going to play Shadows of Mordor, no one thinks I'm going to play Shadows of Mordor for 40 minutes, right? That just doesn't happen. Like, you you know, it's like I'm putting my night into this. It's either like the kids are to bed and I'm going to stay up to 3 a.m. Or I'm in college and I'm not going to do that studying today. And you just sink the time. But a casual game is often played by somebody who has other responsibilities. And they think they can stop whenever they want, but they end up playing for an hour anyway. So if a Angry Birds level takes me like five or six minutes, I think, oh, I can stop every five or six minutes. So if like my family member screams or the thing I'm cooking is done, or I have to get back to my work call, I can stop, but then I'll just play eight levels. And then an hour passed. And it basically turns into the same thing. Ain't that the truth? Yeah. 
when we talked about video games with my friend Ian, he had mentioned something very similar. He's like, my mom probably plays games more than I do, but she doesn't think of it as being a gamer. And I'm the same way. Like I don't, well, I definitely don't play as much as my husband does. He is a hardcore gamer. He spends a lot of hours at it, but I spend quite a lot of time each week doing crosswords. And I never thought of it as a casual gaming experience. It was just something I did that my dad did. And no, it, it like when I look at my phone and it tells me how much time I've spent on various apps, it's surprising. <laughs> Well, I think there's like a history of that, right? I mean, when you go back through the 20th century, there were like times when chess was really popular. There were times when bridge was really popular. There were times when poker was really popular. Um, there's all sorts of people playing sports all the time. People just don't collapse those into the category of games because I think what happened is when digital games arose and when they got branded boy, right, which was a very specific marketing move that happened in the 80s, they became this thing that then gestated on its own and it left everybody else behind, even though all of those people were playing games. And it's only really in the last, I don't know, like 10 years that we've, we've had a very, a real reclaiming of game culture by populations who were left behind. And that's led to this recognition that like, oh no, if I do crosswords, I play games like that. If you had asked somebody that 20 years ago, they would have laughed at you and they would say, I do crosswords, right? Yeah. In some possessive way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, also in a bit of a judgmental way, right? Because there's this idea that there's some nobility is too strong a word, but there's some noble pursuit playing chess or go or crosswords that just is never going to be bestowed upon someone who is crushing it on Candy Crush, as Erica was at the start of our our show. And I knew someone in college who was ranked in the single digits in playing chess, and he maintained that he wasn't particularly smart. He was just really good at playing chess in part because he had practiced a lot. And it was, I don't totally believe him that he wasn't smart, but I took his point that like a lot of things, a lot of it is learning and repetition and mental muscle memory and all those things that go into being good at, at any game. It's a low art form, right? Like I don't mind calling a spade a spade. Like we get clumped in with, <laughs> um, you know, comedy, we get clumped in with comic books, we get clumped in with these forms that people don't take very seriously. And so then I think there's this sort of denigration of it. And because you have to spend so much time with chess or so much time with bridge or so much time with go or so much time with crosswords or, or scrabble, like these games that people think they can find some like alignment, right? That's like, oh, it's about words. So clearly it's good for me. And that allows you to throw Mario under the bus, right? And it basically say everybody playing Animal Crossing is wasting their time. It's because like we want to believe that if it's not obviously tied to something serious or emotionally profound in a small segment of emotions or ambiguously challenging. It can't possibly be good for us. It can't possibly be worth the time. And because of what we do, which is make fun, I think we are always going to be under the shadow of overly productive, overly obsessed with progress, Protestant American values that say that like anything you're doing that could be fun is obviously wasting your time. You would have been better off like painting your house or building a barn or something. I mean, I think you can make all sorts of arguments around that. You could argue that, do I not learn things playing Civ? That's a highly complex strategy game where I have to juggle 15 different goals at the same time. Do I not learn something socializing with people in Animal Crossing? Do I not learn something having my physical body in space with a whole bunch of people with physical bodies in teamwork and competitive structures? Like, I think it's way more complicated questions about like what I get out of games than culture usually gives us credit for. Hmm. You're making me want to look up whether there are religious casual games. You know, I can just like spot that sin, <laughs> be ready to push with it as soon as the sin appears on the screen. Oh, behind me, Satan, behind me, Satan. Well, no, you're trying to make a bell ring because as you know, Mark, every time. So <laughs> <laughs> good point. I am, I am surprised at the number of casual games that exist that have to do with things that we do in real life, like real life jobs. For example, Diner Dash. Also, I don't think it would be considered a casual game, but there's a virtual reality game called Job Simulator. And my husband was so obsessed with that. I played a little bit of it and it was fun. And then I was like kind of done with it. But like many other games, he wants to platinum it. So he does every single thing you can possibly do in it. And I was like, you work in an office. Why are you coming home and playing in an office? And granted, it's cute. You've done a lot of research on this as well. What is the link between playing something that we do in or have every possibility of doing in real life when we don't have to? Why do we work when we don't have to? That's a great theoretical question about games. I'm going to give you a very quick answer and then you tell me if you want me to go off the theory deep end. 
Okay, so when we were testing Diner Dash, when we made Diner Dash, like when we first started making it, we did testing in the game lab office. And I remember supervising a couple of random people we brought in, but like uh, two like kind of women in their 30s, because we were aiming at a demographic that was like 35 to 55 year old women. And at one point they were playing and they were really into it. And one of them turned to me and said, this is just like when I worked in a restaurant with that tone. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember looking at the producer, Peter Lee, and I'm like, Okay, I think that's good. <laughs> like, right. She seems happy. I mean, the simple answer of it is that there's a bunch of ways to think about that concept of work, right? One of which is like, what is the relationship I have to rewards when I work? This is something that a game designer and academic named Naomi Clark has forwarded called like the, the theory of work that like games give us a straightforward reward for effort, which the world does not. Right. Yes. Yes. And so that <laughs> is like fulfilling in a way. Like if I put in two hours of work and I get a very reliable reward, Naomi argues that, well, then actually what I did was I got the fantasy of work fulfilled. And isn't that nice that like I wasn't judged by political stuff or gender stuff or race stuff or class stuff. I just did two hours and I got the same reward everybody else got. But then I'd also argue that like in a more fundamental way, games are work. Right. Like we struggle against them for long periods of time, failing enormously, investing enormous amounts of mental resources, really for no outcome. Right. For nothing. And then we call it fun. Although if you took your husband and you just like looked at him at a moment where he's playing Dark Souls and just dying and dying and dying and dying, none of his expressions would be fun. He would be frustrated. He would be angry. He would be motivated. But, he, but and afterwards, if you asked him, he's like, oh, no, that was a blast. I loved it. And that relationship is like, I think, the paradox of games. It's like, I can make you work and I can make you work thanklessly for hours for nothing. And you will tell me you want it at the end. And that relationship, I think, is, is so interestingly problematic that it should really challenge our understanding of what fun is. But then it opens up these doors to what fun can be that I think are just fascinating. It sounds like what you've just described is hardcore, right? That's kind of the definition, that it's hardcore, it's work, it's something that is a little bit masochistic, you know, like the Dark Souls dying and dying and dying, whereas casual games are, am I wrong, that they're supposed to be the antidote for that, people that are intimidated by the idea of dying and dying, something that's just going to be fairly not taxing. It's hard to generalize. I think the insight there is right. I, I want to nuance it a bit, but I think you're on the right track. When I define the difference between hardcore and casual, right? And, and you mentioned, like, is job simulator casual? And I would say kind of yes for a reason, right? The phenomenon you just mentioned, Mark, of, like, dying and dying and dying, that to me is the characteristic of a hardcore game. A hardcore game is a game where it demands a lot from me to get success and is willing to punish me when I am not successful. <laughs> and that relationship is, it can manifest in a lot of ways. It could be that the controls are really complicated and I have to learn them. It could be the strategies are really deep and I'm just going to get beat every time I walk into this game until I learn them. It could be that like just making that jump, yeah, I have to be hyper precise. And what characterizes a hardcore gamer is basically that I will dive into that difficulty and endure it because I enjoy that slightly masochistic relationship. Casual gamers don't have that relationship. They don't want that. So I often use Bejeweled as my counterpoint, right? Like the Bejeweled easy mode, you cannot lose. There is literally no way to lose it. You just play it over and over again. But that is by a mile the most popular way to play Bejeweled. What's interesting is it doesn't let you win Bejeweled. You have to work to win. You just can't lose. If you play a casual game like Peggle, which is a pachinko game where like a ball drops and then you're trying to get into certain holes, when you score in that game, literally Ode to Joy plays. That's not figurative, like Ode to Joy plays and then it's like a rainbow that shoots across the screen and coins fly everywhere. When you fail, you get a tiny little sound effect that's just like a doop, and that's it. And that is the difference, is that casual gamers don't want to lose. They still want to work. They just don't want to fail working. And so when you see games like Animal Crossing or you see games like, like idle games, right? Like these kind of phenomenon of idle games now, like Adventure Capitalist or Idle Human or Merge Games. Notice how they play. You, you can't lose. Like, there's nothing you can lose. You can go slower. You can get stuck. And you can grind. And people grind those things for hours, but you can't fail. And that, I think, is the kind of the fundamental difference. The game never puts me in a position where I'm losing. But I think I'm still working because I'm still there for hours. Nick, do you consider traditional games that would be considered hardcore 
played at their normal level to be casual games when you nerf them completely. When I start a new game on my PS4 and I'm allowed to choose the casual mode where my enemies can barely hurt me or maybe not even hurt me at all. I'm playing a a swimming game where I can never drown. Are those casual games now or are they just a odd version of a hardcore game? I think of them as casual games, but this is always, in some sense, a contextual definition, right? Because they're casual if you're already over the hump of understanding the PS4 controller, right? And the PS4 controller is a big barrier. But this is also true, like, I don't know if you followed the Ville games on Facebook for a while, but if you look at the late stage Ville games, like Frontierville or Cityville 2, if I just dropped you in that game with nothing, it would be incomprehensible. There's like 50 meters and there's all these icons everywhere. There's nothing explained. There's no tutorials. And it's essentially because like anybody who played Cityville 2, played Frontierville, played Cityville, played Farmville, they know all that stuff. They learned it along the way. So for them, while Cityville... Two is still a casual game, right? In the sense that you kind of can't lose and it's like a pretty simple mechanic to execute. The barrier to enter is so high in terms of the interface that it can't be casual for everyone, right? For some people, it's still going to be too challenging. And that's what I would say there is that like hardcore gamers have always played casual games. Like hardcore gamers, people act like hardcore gamers were always like this little club that stayed away from that, that all the things that they didn't really consider games. That's only this Gamergate grossness that came out of the last few years. Hardcore gamers were always playing Zuma. They were always playing Bejewel. They just played them for other reasons. They played them as a sort of a side of the play that they did. And so I think that kind of play is casual play for a hardcore gamer, but it's casual play for somebody who's so sophisticated with game interfaces that they a casual game for them can be on a PS4 controller, whereas someone who's never touched that controller before could never touch anything on it casually. If we're saying that Crosswords is a casual game, but then a lot of them... They are hard. It's just that they're short. You know, if they're arcade games, you know, there's a version of Pac-Man that was sort of made recently for the iPhone that has this, or I think there was one called Run or something that I have, but like you only play for 30 seconds because you die. (laughs) But it still seems like as long as the art style is done in kind of a glowy way, it's very different from the Dark Souls experience because Dark Souls, you're dying and that keeps you from exploring this massive world as opposed to just one of these little difficult but simple interface platformers where, you know, I can run to the right and I can jump. And that's all. But those are both casual. There's something about the way it's produced too, right? Like how quickly you can create the game that makes it casual or not. These are really interesting questions. Like, does an art style make something casual? I think the answer, I mean, Cuphead proved no, right? Like Cuphead, everyone saw Cuphead and they were like, oh, this is a casual game because it looks like one of those old Looney Tunes cartoons and it's like super hardcore schmuck. But what happened when that happened is there was this collision between the audience expectation of its casuality and the actual gameplay, and it hurt the game sales, right? The game was seriously hurt because people played Mm. it for the first couple minutes, and they were like, I can't even get past this first level. Why did I buy this game for my kids kind of response, right? So I don't think so much that casual games have a certain style as that there's an expectation of a certain style for casual games. And if you don't match that expectation, you're in trouble. Casual games don't also have to be cheaper. See, I'm one of these people who would argue that Flappy Bird is not casual. Like, Flappy Bird is an extremely punishing game. Yes, that's exactly what I had in mind, yeah. Yeah, and so, like, is that a casual game? And I would say kind of no. Like, casual players don't keep playing Flappy Bird, usually. They drop out because, like, they just lose so much. They get sick of it and they walk away. It's less a question of the production costs of the game or the production values of the game, and it's more just about the type of game you're playing. But the trick is also that the business model of casual games often requires like a rapid development cycle because you just you're not going to see the return the same way. Call of Duty is going to make a billion dollars because it's going to sell to a huge population for something like sixty dollars a pop plus DLC. I'm not going to get that on Crossy Road. So I have to make something that's faster and like casual game developers, especially in the mobile marketplace where, you know, a thousand things come out a day, have to like really iterate quickly to try to get to hits because they can't count on a mid-level game succeeding. So they need to drive towards hit making games. And that means a very rapid development process, which I think is why you see casual games sort of lighter. But I, I, again, I would make similar arguments frankly, about things like comedy is that like, you know, because we're a low art form, investing a lot of resources in us doesn't make sense. So like I'm watching what we do in the shadows and I'm just flabbergasted by how what their production budgets are, that they can get the kinds of special effects they're getting for what is essentially a slapstick comedy show. 
is incredible. And it made me realize that like, oh yeah, low arts don't get money. That's just part of how it works. And so if you make a game that's about something that people consider hardcore or consider valuable, that you're talking about a different camp of space, right? You're talking about a whole different world. And Nintendo sits in a weird position regarding this, right? They're the exception to the, all of this. But if I'm making Angry Birds, I'm not going to have $4 million to spend on Angry Birds. That's never going to happen. Like, no one would ever consider me doing that. And I think part of that is because, like, well, what are you making with it? Angry Birds? What do you need $4 million for? <laughs> what if you make a video game about that experience, Nick? It's like you and you only have this much startup money and you have to make a new game. Can you gamify your job into a new casual game? There is one. It's called Game Dev Story. Um, <laughs> and game designers either, it's sort of like rock band for musicians. Game designers right. either, either love it or will never, I, I've never touched Game Dev Story. It is like kind of the most depressing thing I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's supposed to be really good. I do feel it's, it's usually other people's workplaces you want to imitate, right? Yeah, fantasy. It's about fantasy. <laughs> I feel like the money part really comes into play as a consumer because I have a very different viewpoint on something like Flappy Bird. And just for maybe those who don't know, it's a very simple game, right? Where all you're doing is just with a couple fingers, one finger, making a bird flap and try to go from left to right across the screen and not get killed. And I grant that it's hard. And again, I'm not sure this game is even available anymore. Was that one of the ones that got pulled? But my investment is extremely minimal, right? Either it was free or it was 99 cents. I learned how to play it in no time. I learned I was terrible in no time and I moved on. Low entry, low exit. When I buy a game for $60 on my PlayStation, even if I don't like it, I feel like, shit, I just spent $60 on this. I got to stick with it, I guess, to see maybe I'll learn to like it or something. I mean, it's sort of a sunk cost fallacy, but you know, I know that that was money I spent. And so I'm going to invest time because I've invested money and I thought it was something I'm going to like. I guess I'm sort of this cost benefit I don't do it consciously, but it's definitely happening. And I sample new games all the time. And I quit out of them super fast. Like, it, I'll know, like, yeah, not, not my jam. And maybe it's disrespectful, but I mean, I grind through them. I mean, I could load five in a day or just going to bed and bring it up. But like, nope, pass on to the next one. I guess that's the consumer world we're in. How many new ones, Nick, did you say you think come out in a day or in a week? A thousand apps a day, basically. Wow. Oh, God. Yeah, I mean, it's depressing, right? Like, if you make mobile games. Although people make a living doing it, right? Like, you can pull it off. You have to be smart about it. And a lot of stuff, I mean, it's not hard to release something into the Android store. So, like, keep in mind, there's a long tail here, right? Like, there's a lot of garbage that comes in just because people just push it. I mean, I definitely think this is true, but I don't think it's just price. Although I think price is part of it. It's also that you're on your mobile phone. And the way you use your mobile phone is in that kind of very quick consumption format. Whereas if you have a PS4, even booting the stupid thing up is going to lead you to like five minutes of updates and loading and I have to get into the game. So there's a whole different expectation, essentially, of what you're going to do with that device. But this leads to certain kinds of mobile inventiveness that actually came out of hardcore games trying to figure this out. And I think of like, I wouldn't deliberately align this to this attribution, but like certainly a game like Super Meat Boy reinvented how we think about hardcore games because it divided it up into these tiny little levels where you would just die and die and die and die and die and die and die. And, die. and that actually made a master core game, meaning like a very, very, very punishing game, more acceptable because I could just keep trying to do the same jump. And that opened up this whole new world of hardcore games, my favorite of which is Super Hexagon, where like literally the goal in Super Hexagon is to survive a level for one minute. And you will do that for hours, try to survive a level for one minute. But it's okay because the loop of I try, I die, I restart, you can do that loop in less than 30 seconds, right? You can get from dead to playing again in less than two seconds. So as a kind of addictive drive, it's very easy to just sink time into Super Hexagon. I don't think Super Hexagon is a casual game at all, because if I show it to people who don't play games, they see it and they're like, this is so fast, they freak out, they die, and then they just never touch it again. But it brings hardcore games to me, and I think to I think many people who are older especially, in a way that's like, I'm not going to play Final Fantasy VII. I look at that game and I'm like, this takes 65 hours, 
if I don't do anything in it. I don't have that time. I pray that I will be a full-time college professor at some point so that I can dedicate research hours just to playing games I don't have time to play while I run a company. But Super Hexagon, I can squeeze that in. I can play that for 15 minutes at lunch. And so that has created this market, I think, for older gamers who have money but have very little time and still want to have the kind of challenges they used to have but can't dedicate it to the kinds of games they used to play. And so then they start kind of begging for these shorter session, very intense kinds of gameplay models, and the phone just naturally fits that because where are you going to do that? Well, when I'm standing in line, when I'm just sitting on the sofa doing nothing, like I'm getting the kids ready to go and I have like five minutes because everyone's occupied, so now I'm just going to, I could play one level of this, I'm just going to bang it in and then go. Like that's a model of play that's become dominant in our world, and I think that phones enable that. And that's not what people want when they have an Xbox. It's not what they're looking for. I want to stop for a sponsor break and thank Sunbasket for supporting Pretty Much Pop. Sunbasket is a service that delivers healthy, delicious meals straight to your door with recipes for all kinds of dietary preferences, including paleo, gluten-free, Mediterranean, vegetarian, and more. I don't know about you, but I still don't want to leave the house. I want to make as few trips to the grocery store as possible. So Sunbasket is the perfect and delicious solution for the times we're living in. They provide organic produce and clean ingredients with everything pre-portioned and ready to prep and cook. My family was a big fan when I made the black bean tostadas Diablo with cabbage slaw and guacamole. I see this week they have Balinese chicken stir-fry with coconut turmeric cauliflower rice, deconstructed samosas with chickpeas, new potatoes, and peas, lots of these fancy restaurant-type dishes that you can make in as little as 15 minutes, no matter how much experience you have in the kitchen. There's a lot of flexibility in how you order recipes. Skip a week whenever you need to. And Sunbasket is enforcing the highest level of food and employee safety. Right now, Sunbasket is offering $35 off your order when you go right now to sunbasket.com slash pretty and enter code pretty at checkout. That's sunbasket.com slash P-R-E-T-T-Y. Enter promo code pretty at checkout for $35 off your order. Sunbasket.com slash pretty, promo code pretty. I was a little surprised at this term hyper casual. So one of these uh, articles that we'll link folks to was talking about hyper casual games is involving because of this very competitive market, put as little development time into them as possible. Make the interface look really simple. And there's a list of the most popular ones in 2019. I'd never heard of any of these, but when I was just looking at the Apple App Store, I saw quite a few things. One of the ones on your list, Brian, was this uh, two dots. So that's kind of the level of simplicity that I'm thinking of. And and so many of these ones that I just, there's one I think called Toilet Games or something that was from presumably Japan. <laughs> this was like one of the you know things that the Apple Store was highlighting as of this last week. And it just looked so cheap and cheesy. I was very surprised that I guess they're just expecting like, we're going to make a bunch of money very quickly. And then it's going to two weeks later, nobody will have heard this again. Whereas I, I normally picture things in this space like Angry Birds, or actually I was confusing Flappy Bird with Tiny Wings. Tiny Wings is one that is just so beautifully, aesthetically You're a little bird who's sailing up and down hills and just the soundtrack and the colors and things are like that one seemed a super well designed to, you know, even if there wasn't a lot to it, to encourage replayability to stand out against the massive, massive competition. But this one article about hyper casual gaming was saying that, no, actually, that's not the point. Don't try to be the next one of those. That's too hard. Just churn, churn, churn as simple as possible. In a lot of these games, this is true. Like Angry Birds was the 54th game Rovio made. I think that's the number. Oh. A former student of mine, good friend of mine, Kurt Beeg, had, had a studio called Simple Machine, and he made like 20-something games, I think, before he made Pop the Lock, and that was his big game. And that fits into this category. But if you think about the way Brian was describing playing games, it almost makes sense that that would be your model. It's like, I jump into the game if I have a movie, too long, out. Okay, I jump into the game and then I, I play it a little bit. Ah, this is a little clunky, out. I jump into the next game, it's like, ah, oh, rhythm action, I hate this shit, out. I jump into the game and then there's just there's just dots on the screen and I just tap, right? And it's very rewarding in that tiny little moment. As soon as I get in within the first five seconds, I'm like, I got it. I understand how this works. And that loop, if that loop catches me, well, then I'm, oh, well, I'll just play it a little bit longer because it's kind of cool. And I don't even really think about it. It's just It's just very pleasurable to do. That can carry me for a long time. Like Two Dots has been successful for a long time. That game has, has not flipped out of the cycle. But what I think it does is it masterfully captures this world of consumption where I'm basically going to give you like a tiny little amount of my time to sample what you are. 
if you played Metal Gear that way, no one would play that game, right? But if I can give you an interaction that fast, then you kind of get connected to it. And maybe I don't need much more than that if it's good. Maybe you just want to just move those dots around the screen and I don't have to do anything else. And that could be rewarding. And I'm not saying you were doing this, Mark, but I think that there's like, I think it's always the same instinct. It's like, oh, wait, all you're doing is just tapping once to make two dots move. That's not meaningful. What was meaningful was the thing that was four (laughs) times more complicated that I used to do. And are we just low arting all the way down the chain into these experiences? I just think it's interesting that games, because games are so much about interactivity, there's so much about this moment to moment control that's really hard to see the art in it right? It's hard to see the art in something like Pop the Lock. But Pop the Lock took 20 tries at Simple Machine to get to because they learned how in six weeks to make something slick. And that's hard to do. And so even though it's not deep, which is a valid criticism of those games, I think. Um, And I don't play hyper casual games because I like deep games. And so I just, I don't play them. I think there is something really interesting about the fact that people have created that loop and they understand that players can consume in that loop, right? They can consume that quickly. I feel like one of the real problems we have with games and it leads to these kinds of discussions is that like, because games got segmented so fast, we don't think of games like the way we think of other media. Like nobody says they're a TV watcher. That's like a ridiculous phrase. Of course you watch TV. You watch something on something like TV. Maybe you just watch Netflix or Hulu or whatever, but you watch something, but maybe you watch reality TV or maybe you watch like prestige TV, or maybe you only watch spy shows. And that's how you distinguish yourself. But with games, we're still in this place where we have to like defend that we play games at all when everybody plays games. And we should just acknowledge that like, I don't really love hyper casual games as a game player. I also really, really, really don't love idle games. And I kind of hate a lot of RPGs. And that's fine, right? Like, because that's my taste. And like, none of that has any real relationship to whether I'm a game player or not. I mean, how could I not be a game player in the 21st century? Like, I'm literally surrounded by games on every device I have. It's just a question of what games I want to play and, like, what are the loops that fit my life? Well, that kind of begs the question. Do you consider yourself a food eater? I'm just curious. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to take the controversial stance of yes. (laughs) I guess I just wanted to push back on that a little. I just, you know, talking about this with my family and I feel like there's still a serious contingent in the world that like, yeah, I never really saw the point. Like, it's kind of fun to watch you do this a little bit, but like, eh, I think we both, Brian, and I think both of our spouses are uh, on that wavelength, right? With a few exceptions though, because my wife was really into Tetris to the point, I mean, she was way better at it than I was. And in college could, you know, kind of at the fastest speed, just keep it going, which a lot of people, I guess, could. I, I never could. So there are a few things that she latched onto, and she'll watch me play a couple. You know, I know, Nick, you, you're not that excited about role playing games. That's one of the things she will watch me play for a while. Horizon Zero Dawn. She got kind of into what was going to happen to Aloy, and I have to play differently when she's watching because part of being in an RPG is you spend occasionally half an hour just doing your inventory to kind of trick it out perfectly. And, and you know, I'm going to go farm and sell and farm and do this and. When I have an audience, it's like, no, I got to go interact with people because a person just decided to sit down next to me and is not going to watch that. I do see Nick's point on saying that I think most people play something, even if they don't see it as that, though, I don't know what that is for everybody. I couldn't say. And I think some things in their life might be gamified in a way that even if it's how they commute, right? That might be their game and how they're going to get from here to there and hit the fewest number of lights or rat tunnel through a neighborhood or whatever it is. Is it actually a game? No, but like they have their things in their life that they're going to take on as these personal challenges that ultimately don't mean anything much the way that my building, my Lego tower means nothing to anyone but me and my little people. My father gamifies a lot of things. Now that you mentioned that, one of the things that I always thought was the funniest was he, he's very efficient. He's, he's a penny pincher, that one. So he would always think like, how can I get to the next stop sign without actually using my brake? So he would slow down to the point where he needed to, that this car would just stop at the right time. So he would never have to use his brake. And that was one of his favorite games to play when he was driving. I think that that's the thing. When I teach game design, I will often talk about this like office phenomenon of like, have you ever crumpled up a piece of paper and tried to throw it in a garbage can? 
and I, cha- I just interrogate the students about this. Like, so, so do you get up and you put it in the garbage can? And they're like, no. And I'm like, why? And if you push them, they're like, well, that would be too easy. And I'm like, well, what's not too easy? Like, explain to me how you throw the piece of paper into the garbage can. And you get all this weird crap that comes out real fast. It's like, well, I have to sit a certain distance away. I have to keep my, my elbow on the armrest. I can't, like, look at the garbage can. And it's like, this is nonsense. It's like, none of this exists in the world, right? Like, there's none of these limitations in the world. You're just putting them on yourself. And that's, I think, what games are, right? They're arbitrary limits on meaningless goals. And... We do that because that's fun. Now, Mark, I think it's a good debate, right? And I think it's an interesting question, but it's like the same kind of question of like, does anyone not like poetry? Does anyone not like dance? Is it just a question of like, can you find the thing that they would like about that subject? And I've, I've kind of decided in my life because as a game designer, it's not like, like I'm not going to play like a small violin for myself here, but like as a game designer, every so often you get the like, why aren't you spending your time doing something meaningful for the world pressure? And I've just kind of decided that I make fun for a living and I do it in a kind of harmless way. And I'm not going to apologize for giving people joy. Like, it's just, it's just like that, that, that space in my life. And if people don't want to have that joy, okay. I don't know why you don't want joy, but sure, uh, that's cool. I think that there is a question about whether the current media actually appeals to people, right? And I think Brian's example of like, oh, if I play the RPG in the efficient way of playing the RPG, it actually doesn't appeal to people who don't like RPGs. And that's interesting because maybe it's just that that game doesn't exist, right? Like the game that would fulfill your family, that would be like an RPG, just doesn't exist. It's like you have to do all that crap. That's an interesting niche that could be filled. And casual games come up all the time based on this. So Plants vs. Zombies came about because the guy who designed it was playing tower defense games and hated basically like kiting in tower defense games, right? Creating these corridors. If you play desktop tower defense, you know, it's a game where enemies come on offside the screen and you have resources to build towers to shoot the enemies. And one of the tactics in a tower defense game is to build these corridors of towers so that the enemies have to wind around this maze. And you, you basically kite them around a maze. And Brian hated that, so he got rid of it. And then he made a tower defense game without kiting. But the hilarious thing about that to me is that the whole strategy of tower defense is kiting. It's like everything you do in desktop tower defense is building corridors. That's the whole game. I know, Brian, so I was just like, what did you see in desktop tower defense that wasn't that, that was cool? And he basically said, Plants vs. Zombies, right? Like, I saw this thing, and then he made a gigantic casual game success. And it makes you wonder, like, are these just things that hook into people's brains that they're already there? I have a belief, and I have no evidence to back this up, but I don't mind speculating idly, I guess, that, like, when you think about it, it actually does speak to our biology. It would make a lot of sense if... As biological things, we felt a reward for successful action. That seems very adaptive. And it seems like feeling that after major effort would be very adaptive because in nature, we would probably have to do a lot of really hard things. And so if we felt very rewarded when we did hard things, that makes a lot of sense. That seems like a very good motivator for our species. So what if games are just hacking that? It's just hacking that idea that like, if I do something hard, I should be rewarded and my body will give me a reward in form of the endorphins for succeeding at something hard. And all we're doing is tuning this hack of our brains to different frequencies of what kinds of work people like to do. If that's the case, then like, I don't know. It's like, it's, it's, it's a really fascinating thing. It's like, I can hammer at something and then get good at it and win. And the win tells me I succeeded in a way that allows me to release this feeling of, of elation at success. I gave a talk on Super Hexagon that essentially was about that, that, super, that pl- playing Super Hexagon is like running a marathon, like in the literal sense of like doing something very hard and painful for a very long time for no reason, except that you crossed a bar that everyone acknowledged was a bar. But when you get to the other side of it, you jump for joy. And I I have screamed in my office in triumph when I have beaten games that were really hard. And I've had my entire office congratulate me when I screamed for beating that game. I don't know. There's something about that that's just, I, I I remember that. That was a game called Give Up Robot. And like, I will remember that to the day I die, that moment. I, I don't know what that is, if not art. He's good. I just want to say, you're good. You convinced me on on all of the points. It's really fun to talk to you because you come at this whole thing with so much psychology behind it. What's the difference between a game designer and a psychologist? Because I was watching one of your talks and you know you were talking about story, how we develop story through games. I think that psychology and economics and game design are all in the same 
bucket. We're all thinking about incentives and rewards and motivators. So if, if psychologists study that in people and economists study that in systems, game designers are the artists of incentive and reward. And a bit of, I don't want to call it dark psychology exactly, but this idea of how do you make someone keep playing, right? Using some of what's understood about addiction or how people behave. I know there was quite a bit of literature back when World of Warcraft maybe was at its peak about how, that's a Blizzard game, right? They studied how mice or addicts responded to getting rewards some of the time and just how often you could feed out that legendary sword to someone to keep them coming back, to keep them from trying. Because the whole goal is as long as they're playing, they're a customer, right? And as soon as they walk away, they're not anymore. I, I think like a lot of things, like all the low forms of art that you talked about earlier are the same ones that have been accused of corrupting the youth of America, right? Whether it was comic books or games or anything else. And I think a lot of this was just maybe a little bit of hand wringing, but I'm sure there is some truth in it also. I totally agree. We're dealing with brain hacks, right? And there are nasty brain hacks, like variable reward rates, which is like that Skinner box rat stuff. That's a brain hack. And you can keep people hooked on them. It's actually interesting. Richard Bartle in Designing Virtual Worlds, he's a really famous MMO guy who went off. He's an academic, but he also studied MMOs a lot. Actually says in that book that if you don't give an end state to an MMO, you're acting immorally because you're keeping people hooked on this treadmill forever. And certainly companies like Zynga, and sadly, Candy Crush do things like this, right? Like they actually have loops in them that are designed to be variable reward ways. They're designed to change difficulty if you spend money. They do things to kind of keep people hooked. And I think that that is a danger and people should look at that. I, I don't believe in game addiction the way people talk about it personally. And I think when you watch documentaries and see journalism around it, you, you can penetrate it a bit. Dana Boyd and it's complicated, actually. I think like by accident does a lot of that arguing of like, Kids kind of just want to hang out with kids. And if you gave kids ways to hang out, they probably wouldn't spend all their time in PC bongs. But I also think that there is something to creating reward structures that don't have ends, leaving people waiting for like, you know, Diablo style loot drops that are going to hit just enough to kind of keep me around. I think these are questions we should be asking of our field because it is manipulative. And I don't think we know. And I also think that there's just a lot of thinking about this stuff that we haven't really done. I mean, I've played slot machines. I hate them. They're just pointless to me. I don't know why anyone would do them, but I know that people do them endlessly, right? So there's, there's definitely some psychology there that we don't understand. And I think we should be thinking about that. And to me, it's all kind of part and parcel of the same stuff. It's like, insofar as we don't take games seriously, we don't ever ask these questions, except just to say that games are bad. And then we say really dumb things like shooting virtual people is bad, which is like one of the stupidest things I can imagine saying. <laughs> or that somehow shooting virtual people creates violent cultures, which I can disprove like 500 different ways. Whereas if we really interrogated it, shouldn't we be more concerned about loot boxes? Shouldn't we be more concerned about free to play mechanics? Like, aren't those the things that actually could potentially hurt people? Or, you know, frankly, the real stuff that we should be worried about, which is like, how do we build our social networks about these games? And what do we do that encourages bullying or sexism or homophobia in them? You know, what's the representation space of games? And are they representing culture in a proper way? And are we actually asking games to ask questions that are meaningful to us? Like, I think those are much more important questions than the things people ask about games every day. So I don't disagree. Like We made Triumph of the Will out of the same filmmaking techniques that gave us all the great films. I'm not someone who believes that art is always good, right? Like We use art for evil all the time. And why couldn't we use games for evil too? We should be questioning that. You know, Nick spent all this time making me think he was the smart guy, and then he reveals that he doesn't even understand there's a strategy to playing slot machines. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Man. You ever have the experience where you think you're playing one kind of game? Like, again, the reason I think I glom onto some games and not others is entirely because of the art style. Or it could even be a text game. There's one called Universal Paper Clips that I got obsessed with for like, you know, a night. That just because, you know, the way the text is written or the structure, it seems so many games are just complete ripoffs off of other games, right? So it's exactly the same incentive structures. And yet, you know, if it has a different clothing on it, then to me, it'll be a different thing. Or like, then they'll show you ads for other things that they think you will like. And I will almost be offended. Like, you think I would do that? So this, so this, this particular game, which is just some kind of matching game with some randomness to it, it kept showing me things for like slot machine games. And 
<laughs> like, wait, I guess that's sort of what I'm doing, but I'm in self-denial about it because there's no Wayne Helm actually going to play a slot machine game. But they're just throwing shit on the wall, Mark. I mean, it costs them nothing. And if they're wrong, they're wrong. And if they're right, they maybe got a new customer. They're not looking into your soul when they're suggesting you should be playing <laughs> that slot machine game. Mark, to your point, I think you're totally right, right? Bartle got famous actually writing an article called Players Who Suit Muds, and it was all about like why people play MMOs, and it was these like wildly different motivations. It got reanalyzed and reanalyzed and reanalyzed, and there's a whole like a whole line of the literature, which is just basically like why do people play in multiplayer systems? It's like, do you play because you're trying to get all, like check every box on your spreadsheet, right? That's one reason to play. Do you play because you really want to fight other people because you want that challenge? Do you play because I have this hyper-complicated system, and I just want to understand it. And I don't care if I win. Who cares? I just want to understand the system. Or do I play an MMO because my friends are there? And like we go online and we, you know, we spam kill enemies in EverQuest by hitting A over and over again or whatever. But like you just you hit the same button over and over again. But like I'm talking to you about how your kids are doing and I'm wondering like we're talking about sports and we're talking about like who won the game last week and what's going on for you at work. But we need the game, right? Because we need a campfire to stare at. So we're just going to keep hitting the button. And this is one of the other ways I think we don't really talk about games. And I think your insight is really good. Like sometimes I'm playing this game just because I really, really just like clicking in it. It's just so cool to like swipe in this game that I don't care about anything else. I just want to keep swiping. And sometimes I'm playing the game because I just really like the story. And I just want to see where the character is going. And yeah, the grind is awful. But like, I don't care. I'm just like getting past that. And sometimes I play the game because it just looks cool. And I just want to be in this cool universe for a while. Or, like, I like the music. Or, like, my friends are playing it, and I kind of hate this game, but it gives me something for my friends to talk about. Or I'm playing with my child, and I'm playing, like, the shittiest game of chess I've ever played in my life, but I'm teaching her how to play. And that's fun. Or I'm just going to play basketball, but we're going to half play, right? Because I'm really just hanging out with you. We're not even talking. Right. But we're just around each other. I think all of these are reasons to consume these systems. Like all of these are ways we use them because that's the thing is like what's super interesting to me about play is that play is a creative act. It's like taking a system and doing something with it. That's my own expression. And nothing once a game goes out into the world can tell you how to play it. You just do what you want. So I can like warthog jump in Halo till the end of time and nothing in Halo is going to tell me that I didn't save the earth. Right. Like the game doesn't care. It just lets me warthog jump. And you can make the game into that for you. And like a lot of the really beautiful game communities that have developed, developed that way by hijacking games for their own purposes or writing their own rules. I think it's a beautiful thing, actually, that people can make systems that get reused. But that's a game designer thinking, right? Like a game is cool to me when I see a player do something with it I couldn't have expected or I see them master something I couldn't know. So I, I worked on this game called Jumpbot at Game Lab. I was a level designer on it. And I made all the levels in Jumpbot. It's a puzzle game with like 60 levels. I made every level in it and I set the expert goal in every level, right? So that you were basically, the way the game worked is that Jumpbot would walk around on his own And you had to move Lego bricks to get him to these trash cans, these recycling cans. And you were scored based on how few moves you used. So the less moves you used, the better. And so I was the human being who set every expert goal in every level, meaning this is the minimum number of moves you should use to get the highest score in the game. But we also just tracked how many moves you did, right? We just kept track. So at the end of the game, I had gotten, I think, something like 250 or 300 moves like for the whole game. That was like my score with all the expert goals. And about a year later, I went online, and the lowest score in the game was at least 80 moves lower than that. Oh, man. I was just like, how is that? Because po- in some of them, some of those levels, there's literally no way to do it in less moves. Like, it's just not possible. So I'm like, it isn't like they shaved one move off of every level. It's like, they succeeded in two moves in a level that took me 10. Like, how did they do that? And that's amazing. It's one of the most beautiful experiences as a game designer is to realize that there are people in the world who have mastered the system better than you did. So I guess to get back to your point, yeah, I think all of that stuff is, is a reason to play a game. Even if it's just like, I like zombies and this is about zombies, right? That's a reason to play. And I think that we're arrogant about our craft. We're snobby about our craft if we just don't recognize that people do that. But then I also, I often think of like, how do people start playing Pokemon? Like kids start playing the Pokemon card game when they're like seven. They can't play a card game that sophisticated when they're seven, but they don't. They just role play with it. They just like pretend they're Pokemon or they tell stories about Pokemon while they throw cards around. And who's to say that's not a valid way to play Pokemon? So maybe as a way of wrapping up here, can we go around the horn and see if folks have one game to recommend in this rough genre? 
I think we're going to have very unequal uh, amounts of experience to draw on. But Erica, do you want to start? Oh, my God. Why me? <laughs> Just to be mean to you. Do you have anything that you in particular that caught your fancy? I guess it depends on, once again, like what how we would categorize it. But I was telling Mark and Brian, I've been playing some virtual reality games. And I find them to be really pleasing. I'm working on A Fisherman's Tale right now. And it's definitely a puzzle game. And it just makes me feel wonderful to be in that little world, especially when we're in lockdown. So I don't think you can die in it. So in that way, I could call it maybe casual, but it's also virtual reality. And- Excellent. Brian, I think I know which one you're going to pick. No, I'm going to leap to the defense of two dots. Not that it needs my defense. I don't know that hyper casual is quite how I describe it. In part, it has something like Candy Crush's mechanism of getting really pretty hard. To the point where I won't buy lives. So if I run out, I have to put the game away. So I have to really think strategically if I want to economize my time and to be able to play. And I feel like it can be pretty difficult or to the point where I'm thinking five or six moves ahead. I actually had to stop playing it because like Candy Crush, it would ruin my sleep. I would be playing it and I would be exhausted when I'd wake up. I'm like, I can't believe I just spent all night dreaming about this game because it maybe it was too much pattern recognition, too much filling my eyeballs all at once. But I think it's uh, deceivingly challenging, despite how simple it is in the beginning. Nick, do you have one in particular that you haven't brought up yet that you feel like this stretches the bounds of what a casual game could be? Is that something particularly recommendation worthy? I'm going to give two. One that's digital and one's not. I'm just going to push boundaries. You mentioned Universal Paperclip, so I'm going to go to the, the progenitor of that and say Candy Box. People should go find Candy Box. Is that a pure text thing like Paperclip? Yep, pure text. Okay. It was the originator of that whole genre and super interesting little game. I think very clever, very good narrative. Dicey Dungeons just won a bunch of stuff at IGF and people should check that game out if they haven't. That game's great. And I'm just going to say, if you're like stuck on Zoom and you're looking for things to do with people, play Codenames. Codenames is like one of the best Zoom adaptable games there is. There is a digital version. Um, if you Google code names, you'll find the digital version very quickly. But I would just say if you're looking for something to do with friends in this like time of social isolation, I think the single best game I've seen for people is code names. Nice. If you ever want to be disappointed in your friends, play code names with them. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys. What about you, Mark? I play so many of these games with a veil of self-hatred that I don't want to recommend them. <laughs> and they're the same way. But I, just looking back in time a little bit, I think of the many games of this sort that I got briefly obsessed with, Feeding Frenzy was one oh. that I thought had really nice art style and it was pretty damn easy and just like felt good to move around in. And that's probably out of people's heads at this point. So I, will, I recommend looking back at that. Can I tell a story about Feeding Frenzy quick? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the way Diner Dash came about was we were trying to incubate new ideas for casual games. And I was tasked with doing some of that. And so I, I looked around and I was playing Zuma a lot. And the theory was that I was like, Zuma is really hard. Casual gamers are fine with things that are hard. They just don't want things that are complicated. And then I played Feeding Frenzy. And I know the guy who made Feeding Frenzy. And I was like, oh, this is a game about fish that shit coins. And I'm like, people tap a lot of coins. And I'm like, I think people just like to tap. What if I made a hard game that was very simple to understand where you tap a lot? And that was the origin of Dr. Dash. Excellent. <laughs> nice. You heard it here well, first. Well, probably. Yes. Not, but you heard it here most recently. <laughs> <laughs> when I told my daughter that you were going to be on this thing talking about casual games with us, he was like, Diner Dash is not casual. It takes full concentration. It's very <laughs> stressful. So. True that. Yeah, that's exhausting. Uh, the secret is chaining. You have to chain. <laughs> Thanks so much, Nick. Great talking to you. Thank Thanks yeah, thank so, you so much, much for being here. Now, before you go, I have to tell you what the strategy is for slot machines. I wasn't kidding. I had a friend in college who told me this. <laughs> I thought it was pointless. I mean, gambling itself, pointless. His theory was that you watch the slot machines because by law, they have to pay out a certain amount, right? They have to a certain looseness. But you watch someone who's been there a long time and leaves with an empty bucket. And that's a machine that statistically does need to pay off at some point. And so you play it for five minutes. And if it doesn't pay off, then you leave it. You don't want to be the one who keeps putting money in it. But you want to go to machines that other people have played unsuccessfully, knowing that they're more likely to pay off than just a machine you know nothing about. Now, I think there might be something to it, but it still seems like a terrible idea. But there you have it. (laughs) 
<laughs> I make no official response to that, given that this will be published. All right. Bye, listeners. Bye. Bye, everyone. Get more Pretty Much Pop at prettymuchpop.com. Get bonus content for every episode at patreon.com slash prettymuchpop. Pretty Much Pop is part of the Partially Examined Life podcast network, and it's also presented by openculture.com.